You're listening to Sunny Side Up, a B2B podcast that brings you the juiciest insights from go to market leaders and practitioners. Hey everyone, welcome back to Sunny Side Up. I'm your host, Chris Moody, and today I'm super excited to talk to Beth Forrester on journeying across roles, insights from entrepreneurship to corporate leadership. Beth is a dynamic marketer fueled by a passion for data and storytelling. From founding her first company in her early 20s to her experience as a product marketer in the tech industry, she's gained a deep understanding of market dynamics, pricing strategy, SaaS business models, consumer behavior, and product positioning. Beth has a unique career trajectory, which we'll talk about some today, entrepreneurial spirit, and diverse experience that's established her as a formidable leader in her field. She's currently the VP of Marketing at Animoto, where she leads a team of talented and passionate marketing and customer service professionals. Beth, really excited to have you on the show. Thanks for joining. Well, thanks, Chris. I'm really excited to be here and chat with you. Yes, I'm excited too. And I I know we talked about this a little before we hit the record button, but can you talk about some of the insights that you've had transitioning from an entrepreneur to a corporate executive? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like it was, it was actually really scary. I'd been an entrepreneur at the time for like over 20 years. Um, I'd started and ran several businesses in that time frame, um, And I was about 45 or 46 and I decided that I needed a, a, a career change. I wanted something more. It felt like a now or never situation. Um, and it was, I won't lie, it was super scary. Uh, but I felt like I had developed a lot of um, a lot of skills uh, in my career as an entrepreneur, but but I felt like I had more room to grow. And, and I thought that if I could get in an opportunity where I could sort of scale the types of things that I was doing um, and I could also create a little more longevity in my in my career as a, the, the, I was uh, in my entrepreneurial business. Um, it was a very uh, physical job that I was doing. So I didn't see a lot of longevity. I needed to move to more of a desk job, let's just say. Um, so it was, it was scary, but it was at the right time. And, you know, looking back, it was the best decision that I ever made. I love that. It's always following the passion or your heart that leads to the best decision too. So I, I love that story. And, you know, now you're, you're in the video space at Animoto and you've built out, an awesome product marketing function. So could you tell us some about the learnings you've had there? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting for me moving from being an entrepreneur to to working in a corporate environment. Um, There was just a lot of things um, that I had to sort of to learn that I didn't have to do as, as a sole proprietor of a very small business. You know, I made all the decisions. I didn't really necessarily have to communicate really early and often or create this sort of alignment. There were things and functions that I just sort of did independently and I ran the business and it was very different. Uh, when I came to Animoto, you know, I really had to start to learn more about how to gain alignment, how to gain stakeholder buy-in, what, what was important uh, to follow as far as um, what the metrics were quite different than I was looking at because we were in a SaaS business. So I had a lot to learn there. Um, it was just, a, there was just a lot to go from being a sole proprietor or, or, you know, someone in a very, very small business to really navigating that larger organization where you're not the end decision maker. Um, and then thinking about there, you had so many opportunities in front of you, just how to prioritize your time, your team's time and the efforts time. So it's just really, uh, it was a really challenging, but fun experience for me. I love that. I love that. And product marketing is not an easy function for those who are listening, who have not been in product marketing. There's always a balance of working with the product team and the marketing team and the sales team and all of the other teams to bring things to life. And you've built an amazing strategic framework to help tier product releases and make sure that you're always leveraging key business metrics to contribute to the overall growth of the company. I'd love to learn more about that because I think that many folks who haven't been in product marketing think that it's just the coordination between when things launch and what people need to know. And there's so much more to it. There, there's a lot to it. And I do think that my experience as, a, as an entrepreneur and sort of having that holistic view of the business and business metrics did really help me a lot along the way. Um, I'd also been able to 
um, you know, I'd done everything. So I was customer support. I was sales. I was, I was in charge of the pricing and packaging. I was in charge of all the marketing. You know, I was doing everything. Um, so for me, it was a, it gave me the ability to see the bigger picture of how all the, the different departments and functions were working together to drive us toward the same goal. Um, and that was, you know, that was fun, but it was also a challenging challenge, right? When I first came to Animoto, there was a lot of, you know, product sort of worked in a silo and, it, and they basically came and said, okay, here's what we built now go market it. And for me, I, you know, I was doing a lot of jobs to be done interviews, trying to really understand the value and why people were purchasing. And I was like, this is not really necessarily what people are telling me they want or, or see value in. So it's a little hard to sell that, you know, that feature, like it's a great feature, but it's maybe not the most important feature out in the market. Um, and so I really had to really work. And at the time, I didn't know what part product marketing was. I had no clue what product marketing was at that time. So I started really reading a lot about, about product marketing and I realized what I was doing within the company and why it was important. So I started to surface and talk about why product marketing was important, why it was important to bring that marketing voice to the table sooner rather than later, earlier in the, in the product development process. And so, you know, these were the things that I started to really champion, but I, I also had to get buy-in at, at first it was uh, challenging to people because they felt um, they were sort of protecting their turf, let's just say. Um, and they didn't really, you know, they were concerned. Um, so it was, it was interesting that to build this case for product marketing, explain to the company what it is and why it's important and what role a product marketer plays in an organization. And it wasn't just a challenge with like, product and engineering and, and leadership at that time, it was also even a challenge with my own marketing team, right? They're like, well, what do you mean you're going to do this? And this team's going to do, what are we doing? And are you just going to tell us what to do? It was like, no. So I really had to make everybody, it was a lot about, a lot of diplomacy was involved, I won't lie. But uh, there's a lot of making everybody feel comfortable and understanding like how it would make their job easier, how it would make their team more effective and how it would work within the organization. I love that. And I, I know you you had a scoring model, too, with some questions that that guided how you tiered the product launches and the corresponding resources and how people picked it up and promoted it. Could you tell us more about some of the questions that you were thinking about that would help that process? So, yeah, the so um, pretty early on, as I was sort of making the case for product marketing and really trying to stand it up within the organization, I wanted to bring some some sort of order or framework to it that also made other people gain that buy in, feel that alignment early on that they were part of the decision making process. And so I came up, I didn't come up with it all on my own, but, you know, I had read about tiering frameworks and a lot of how they were used to determine like how much marketing efforts would be used on a particular launch. Um, and then I really started to read up a little bit more on it and realizing how I could make it work to create that alignment across the org and have everybody centered on what the value is we're going to deliver to, deliver to customers. Because it always felt like everybody was sort of in their own silo and they were focused on this one metric of like, we want more people to, to you know, finalize more videos. And it's like, well, that's really important, but what's the most important part of that journey that's going to help drive dollars and monetization. The marketing team, we were focused on selling the product and, and getting our dollars, but I needed everybody to sort of think about that in their lens as well. Um, so I, you know, again, this is not something I made up on my own, but I did sort of modify it to fit our needs. So thinking about sort of like our main metrics that we were uh, concerned about. So it was really a simple six question scoring method. Basically, you assign a score based on yes, no, or maybe, and you ask these questions and they were really related to the important, you know, SAS metrics, right? Revenue, new business, uh, a churn, uh, our flywheel, our word of mouth, how, how much how much do we get out of that adoption and expansion and then also differentiation, which is always big in the product marketing world. Right. So it was just taking simple questions like, is this going to open up new revenue streams by attracting new business or markets? And it's like, yes, no, maybe that's it. 
if it's yes, you get three. If it's if it's no, you get one. Maybe you get two. Is it going to increase uh, re-engagement or reduce churn? Yes, no, maybe. Super simple types of things. Um, is it a differentiator? Will it help us win out over competitors? Yes, no, maybe. These were the things that were really, you know, core to our business and our success and helped us understand collectively what was going to be really valuable to the business. Um, the first time we did this exercise as a, you know, I, I surfaced it a lot. I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations to talk about. This is why it's important. This is how it's going to help. Then you're going to know how much effort marketing is going to place on, on these initiatives. Um, and the first time they scored the initiatives they thought were on their roadmap, they all came back and they're like, wow, these are all really low scores. <laughs> and, uh, they're like, wow, I, I had no idea. Because a lot of it was, some of it was even a bug fix. It's like, well, that's that's a tier four. That's a bug fix. It's not a tier one launch. So it was really amazing to sort of see everybody when they actually got into the worksheet and did it collectively. And they're like, oh my gosh. So it really changed the conversation really quick. And I saw, you know, they, they started to like really love it because it helped them actually, you know, prioritize their roadmap and the things that were important to the business. I love that. I, I want to do the double click on metrics and challenges. But before I do, I, there was, you know, you started to hit at voice of the customer and understanding what was really important to the customer. I'm assuming that a background as an entrepreneur really helps you to understand the value of what do people actually want versus Here's what's coming. Here's what we need to promote. Were there any learnings from your previous background before you jumped into tech leadership where you really think an entrepreneur may have a leg up on someone to understand the audience better? I mean, I think for me, because coming from an entrepreneur, you know, I had a high touch with my customers all the time. You know, like my business was a very high touch. I was constantly dealing with the customers. I did have an online business at one time where I didn't have a lot of face to face time. But my main business was where I spent a lot of time with customers. So I got to hear feedback in real time really quickly about, you know, what they valued, where I where I saw, you know, dollar signs in their eyes, where I saw them spending leaning towards. So when I came into the tech space, um, you know, my job was to be sort of the voice of the consumer and to make sure that the communications were effective to them meeting their needs. Um, and what I found most beneficial was, again, getting on the phone, talking to these customers. And so we were in all an online business, Animoto is an online video creation tool. So it became a little harder to talk to those clients. Um, but I still found such value in those conversations. And like I said before, those jobs to be done interviews to really understand, like, why are they hiring you and what are they firing were really beneficial. And when I started to be able to bring those conversations into the org and talk about those, I, I think that also a lot of light bulbs went off because it, it meant something when they I could go in there and tell them all day, like, this is what people want. This is what people value. But when I could share a recording with them or share verbatim what that customer said, it was a lot more powerful. And I learned that right away. Yeah, I, there's just no substitute for those learnings. And the thing I would say to anyone listening who hasn't been in front of a customer in any role, it honestly doesn't matter what. I was a product manager. I'll never forget the first time it all clicked with me and medical devices because I represented a fairly sophisticated product. But the biggest issue once we started to talk to customers was the mobile stand that the product went on, which had nothing to do with the product. It was a stand that we sourced and the number one complaint was the baskets were breaking. And once you started to talk to customers, they're like, we love the product, but we can't buy more if we have to keep putting baskets on. And the solution at the time was send them two more baskets. Every time we went break, they would send two more baskets. And then we started to look at it and make the business cases. Look, why don't we just buy a more expensive stand? We'll charge a little more at the beginning and then it's going to be happy. They're like, well, I don't know what our distributor would Think about that. I was with our sales leader. We were in the room with a multi-billion dollar distributor. I'm six foot five, like I'm a big guy. And they were like, well, we don't know if this is going to be better. And I just stood up and held the 
product by the basket. So the stand and the product has started swinging it around. And we were like, we don't think you'll have the same complaints anymore. They're like, okay, we're good. So it decreased margin. But there was honestly no way to know that if I wasn't forced to go talk to the nurses and talk to the doctors and really understand and what's going on in the market. And I, I think many of us that are working in tech, many of us haven't had a role like that where you can have the light bulb go off. Yeah, it's so it's really powerful. And it's so interesting because sometimes I feel like they're saying things that I'm trying to decode what they're saying, but you start to hear things over and over again and you realize, well, this is really a problem. And how can we solve this pain point for our users, right? Yes. Love that. Love that. Well, what are some of the big metrics you were looking at in your function to guide business? Um, as I sort of mentioned in some of those questions you talked about, you know, really was like sales and revenue, obviously, uh, monthly recurring revenue, uh, retention and, and churn reduction. So, you know, obviously that's going to, you know, layer in an impact to our recurring revenue, which is really important. Um, also expansion revenue it was something that, um, at one point, we really only had one viable price point. So there really wasn't a lot of cross sell, upsell opportunities for our product. So we've been, you know, building out the ability to, to sort of move people up in as far as their, their level. It's kind of like a, here's a package one, you get one and that's it. We had another one. It just wasn't that viable. Um, so really thinking about expansion revenue and how we, we grow as our customers grow. Um, so those were the things that we were most focused on and as well as adoption, right? Cause I know that if more people adopt the product adoption is where they get the value, right? And they're, and when they're using and engaged with the product, that's really the only way to, to sell it. So, you know, understanding that were, those were sort of the key metrics that we were focused on. Now we had some other tangential ones, like I said, you know, we had a freemium business model, we were product led growth. So there were other things too, like, you know, does this, help grow our top of funnel? Is this a, a, you know, some sort of initiative that will lead to product led growth? Right. So, you know, then that just depends on what your business model is and, um, you know, what you're trying to do. All right. Uh, I'm sure with any new framework, you may have run into one challenge, maybe two. Right? <laughs> if, if you had to bubble up the biggest challenges you had rolling out a strategic framework, what were those? I think the, the biggest thing was buy-in, right? I had to get everybody bought in that this was going to actually work, number one, and that it was easy. It wasn't going to take more time. Uh, so the time and effort is, is always a big issue. And really to believe like they were part of the process. So, you know, when you want to get that buy-in, you, you really have to make other people feel like they're part of the solution you're solving. And so, you know, one person told me like, oh, this is a really diplomatic thing because basically what we wanted is for marketers to sit on product teams, right? So when they were starting to talk about the development of a feature and develop those types of things, we wanted, let's tear it right away. Let's start to expand, think about how we're going to sell this in the future and how much value it brings. And so, you know, that was that was probably a little more challenging to 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 help to get marketing inserted into those conversations earlier. But basically once everybody knew, like you're all going to get to score it, we'll score it together and we'll make these decisions together. Uh, they, they started like, Oh, okay, well, yeah, that'll help me do my job. Right. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, how do you think your background in business and entrepreneurship helped you to navigate all the different groups and stakeholders and various challenges that you've encountered throughout your career? Yeah, I think that probably the number one thing, to be honest with you, like I said, I, as a as a sole proprietor, small business owner, I had to wear a lot of hats. So I had to do everything from customer support to product development to, uh, you know, to sales, to all of the marketing, you know, all of that I was doing myself in my old job. So when I was able to start to build relationships with other people, stakeholders that I needed buy-in for, I had empathy for them. I understood their challenges. I understood the pain points they were going through. And I was able to speak their language to a certain degree. So I think that really helped a lot because, again, 
probably the most beneficial thing. And, and this is what I teach my product marketers at Animoto that you can bring as a product marketer is diplomacy and gaining trust and being able to collaborate well with your team. Because once you get that trust, that's really what's important. So I think that was really key. I think, again, just running a business and having a more holistic picture. You know, everything that I did in my business led to me putting, you know, food on my table, me having insurance, roof overhead, every so so every component that I had done in my business was like, is this going to help me make money? And I found when I moved into corporate world, people got so siloed that every little thing they did didn't translate to making money the way that my brain was wired, right? So that was what the tiering framework brought. It's like, how's this going to make us money? And so then it sort of put everybody in that same mindset. I think that's great. It's always different when it it's about putting food on the table, right? When you're running your own business, that's that's what it's about. It's it's already going to do these things. Uh, one question we love to ask, well, there's actually two, but the first, uh, are there any books, blogs, newsletters, websites, or videos that you think our listeners should jump into or read? Um, I think be number one, like probably the oldest book that every person that goes into business is going to tell you is how to win friends and influence people. Like there's just no getting around that. And I think if you're going to be a product marketer, you really do. You know, that book talks a lot about empathy and listening. I was always a really inquisitive. I love to hear people's stories. So I like to talk to people and hear more about them. And that's part of what that book's about, right? But if you're going to be a product marketer, you need to be able to, to, to influence in an organization. Um, Product Marketing Debunked is a is a great book. I read that early on when I was really trying to like define product marketing at Animoto, what it was and explain to others. It was a really great book that I think really talks about a lot of the things that, that product marketers are focused on. Um, and then another one, I think one of the other challenges that I really didn't talk about um, is coming up so, sort of through the ranks at Animoto and in my, you know, in the startup world is man management, right? I had done everything, <laughs> you know, like I had done everything from start to finish. I handled everything. So really, you know, and for many years at Animoto, like I was still an IC, like I, I sort of acted on my own behalf. But then when I started to manage a team and my team grew and grew and I started to manage more people, I had to think about differently about, now I can't do all this, but how do I make help others? And how do I sort of multiply the effects of, of, the, of, of the work and everybody's work together? So it was a really interesting, at that time, I needed a lot of help in trying to really understand how to move from that IC or individual role into sort of a management role and, and trying to sort of scale the things that I was doing and build trust with the team. Totally. Totally. What about people? Are there any folks that you think we should have on the show or that our listeners should follow? Well, I think uh, you know, the book that I mentioned, Yasmeen, is the writer of the product marketing debunked. She's got two or three books out, I think, on product marketing right now. I think she's she's really great. Um, another person. So even in my old entrepreneur, I've always been obsessed with pricing and packaging like that. If I could just sit and run pricing tests all day and night, like I would do it because it's so fascinating to watch how people change uh, their behavior based on the things that you do. Um, but Patrick Campbell's always really good. You know, he's a founder of Profit Well. I think they're owned, they were acquired by Paddle. Um, but I, I love reading his, his stuff and, and uh, I think a lot of people will too. Definitely. Yeah, we are certainly prioritizing that right now, actually. So we're, we're working on that. Uh, that may be the first person we reach out to. But um, how can people get in touch with you after the show? Um, so you can either find me on LinkedIn at Beth Forrester. It's F-O-R-E-S-T-E-R. -E so just one R. Um, or you can email me. You can email me directly, beth.forrester at animoto.com. And if anybody wants that tiering framework, I have a doc on sort of how it's set up, why it's important. Um, I could even share a deck that I sort of surfaced around right. to people to, to sort of build that stakeholder buy-in and have everybody understand like why, how it's going to benefit us. But you can either reach out to me through a DM through LinkedIn or that email, and I'm happy to pass along that information or give you, you know, anything I can 
give you, I'm happy to do it. Amazing hook and call to action there. So did that come more from marketing and tech or from entrepreneurship? (laughs) (laughs) Both. (laughs) I think probably more from my entrepreneurship. It's like, you know, you got to leave somebody with a call to action. Like there's just like, what's next? Like you got to tell them what to do. As an entrepreneur, um, I used to teach other small business owners too about their pricing and packaging and strategy and uh, a lot about running their business and thinking about their time. So, you know, time was always a big issue for me of like, how am I going to prioritize my time and get the most ROI out of my time so I can get the, the, the biggest bang for, you know, you know, the biggest buck for my bang or what, however you want to say yeah. it. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I mean, I, I think it's so important. And then I always appreciate when you have a great call to action, the folks who take you up on it, knowing that it's at the end of an episode, there's always some some great relationships that come from the people who do reach out. So hopefully some folks will, but thanks so much for joining the show today, Beth. I think it was awesome, extremely informative for everyone. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed it and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Sunny Side Up. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us and subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube and Demand Based TV. 